Welcome back to the Middle Tech Podcast. Hope everyone had a great Easter weekend. Uh, if you got to go out to Keeneland for opening day, got to enjoy some great weather this weekend. It finally feels like spring is in Kentucky. Did you get to do anything fun this weekend? I know we got to go to the steaks party, yep. which was a great time. Yep. So I had a steaks party. That was a great time. And then a lot of family time on Easter in uh, Bargetown and Elizabethtown and watched a lot of golf, which was good. It was a good Masters. It was a pretty entertaining Masters. John Rahm, yep. the winner. Yep, I was kind of pulling for uh, Brooks Kepka, but uh, he kind of fell apart. Dude, after seeing his uh, his segments in the uh, full swing on Netflix, it kind of sucks to know that he's like yeah. dealing with all the I know mental mental uh, issues that come with playing the and game then, of golf. Uh, Phil Phil Mickelson. Yeah, I don't know. That was wild. That was wild. That was yeah. wild. Um, anyway, we've got some great stories to go over today. So we're going to be talking about uh, a company that we've had on the podcast back on episode one forty one. Uh, so it is the uh, the performance uh, drink Focus. Uh, so Jack Harlow has bought into that company. Uh, so there's a, a cool story around that. We're going to be talking about Tesla lowering the price of the Model X and the Model S. Uh, and then we're also going to be talking about uh, the new Restrict Act, which is the bill that's been introduced to uh, try and ban TikTok effectively. Um, but what it is is more of just a really broad and vague bill. So we're going to be breaking that down a little bit. Um, before we dive into those stories, please remember to uh, follow us on all of our social channels at Middle Tech Pod. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with the latest that we're talking about. And before we dive in, we just want to get a quick word from our sponsors. Middle Tech is presented by KY Innovation, the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development's Office of Entrepreneurship. KY Innovation is currently accepting applications for its SBIR STTR matching funds program. Kentucky's program is a national trendsetter for providing critical non-dilutive capital to support the high-tech research, development, and commercialization of novel ideas within the Commonwealth. SBIR matching funds have directly contributed to the creation of more than 700 jobs, more than 200 patents filed, and more than $160 million raised in private follow-on funding into dozens of companies relocating to the state. The matching funds application window is open through April 24th. To apply and learn more about support services for companies that want to explore SBIR, STTR grants and contracts, visit kyinnovation.com SBIR. Middle Tech is sponsored by Bolt Marketing. Take your website to the next level with a website that's built to work. At Bolt Marketing, they're revolutionizing websites for small businesses that are affordable, customizable and hassle-free. Whether you have a construction company, a boutique clothing store, or you own a hot yoga studio, they have options for you. Click the link in our show notes to explore their marketing options that can transform your marketing and grow your business. And as a personal note, Bolt Marketing built our website and they were awesome to work with throughout the entire process. We highly recommend working with them. All right, so this first story, uh, I think you sent me this on Instagram and I was pretty taken aback when I saw it. Uh, Focus, which was a favorite drink of ours, still is a favorite drink of mine whenever I, I find it and, uh, and buy it, um, has been bought partially by Jack Harlow. Um, so there's some movement going on from the Louisville-based drink company. Um, it seems that Jack Harlow is now their creative uh, chief creative officer, I believe is how it's, it's, how it's been described. Uh, and it's under a new CEO as well. So um, give us a breakdown on, on some of the details around the story and let's really break down kind of this whole model of a creator, somebody with an established audience doing a move like this. Yeah. So essentially Jack Harlow and his, this new team came in and, and bought Focus, full rebrand, new leadership team. Uh, and so they're taking this product to market through Jack Harlow's brand. So let's share the website and kind yeah. of show what this brand actually looks like. But they're taking a, a playbook that has been used by another Louisville-based company called Congo Brands. I actually sat down with the founder of that company and got coffee with him, Max Clemens. Uh, that company is absolutely killing it. They're they're known to launch brands like Alani New, 3D Energy, uh, Prime Hydration, which Logan Paul uh, mm -hmm. is and KSI are pushing. And so they launch brands through these influencers, and these brands just absolutely blow up. And so, you know, Congo Brands is well on their way. Uh, past a billion dollar company. Uh, the founder, I believe, is in his late 20s. So Max is pretty young. So it's a proven model that if you have a group of influencers or an influencer that has enough reach to launch a new brand through of a kind of a hot product, which caffeinated drinks are a very, very hot product, especially over the last, I'd say, three, four years, it's really grown. So Celsius, uh, brands like Focus and others are exploding on that caffeine uh, kind of carbonated uh, energy drink, 
category, and this is just another one of those plays, and I think Jack Harlow has a good enough brand uh, that we can see what happens. And again, this is a originally a Louisville company, and we had them on the podcast, and so it's kind of crazy to see a, a full rebrand like this. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. You mentioned Prime Hydration, uh, just to touch on that. Um, that was actually one of the companies that I pulled up when doing some research for this story. I think I saw a figure that it was reported they did $250 million in revenue in their first year. Yeah. So it just kind of shows the potential that if you have a pre-established audience, if you're a creator um, that you know has a following, you can really uh, use this playbook to generate some serious revenue. So this is a huge business opportunity here. And as we're sharing the website on the screen, you can kind of see how they've kind of rebranded this and make it really fit Jack Harlow's brand. So they're kind of saying this is the remedy for writer's block, which I like. It Focus, if you've not had it before, one, recommend trying it. It's a delicious drink. But two, it really does give you kind of a, a unique type of energy. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have any way of describing the mixture of like caffeine and I think it's L-theanine, right? Yeah. It's more of like a mellow kind of caffeine burst. Yeah. Um, so I think this rebrand just really makes sense from the standpoint of like, Jack Harlow being an artist and saying this is the remedy for writer's block and then also being a Louisville-based company and Jack Harlow, of course, yeah. being from Louisville. Yeah, I don't uh, know if uh, kind of a um, – what did you – how did you describe it? A mel- uh, a, uh, you said something and you described it with an M. Oh, wait, the – The way it makes you feel. Uh, like a mellow yeah, kind of person. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. I would say it's more of like a clean kind of energy that doesn't mm-hmm. give you the jitters like coffee. Coffee gives me the jitters, and so that's why I started yeah. drinking – focus to begin with it's a way more cleaner kind of energy i feel like um and it, i think it's kind of uplift, uplifting uh for myself so it kind of like this says as a remedy for writer's block yeah and just to provide some additional details to the story we don't know the full details on this so i'd like to talk to john about that before making any uh more like speculation on it but what we do know is that there is a new ceo uh that is now um in charge of the company joey so nickel Joey Nickel, yeah, so I went and looked at his LinkedIn. He's got a lot of really relevant experience. I think he was the SVP of Bang Energy Drinks. Um, so he's coming in. He's going to be the new CEO. And it sounds essentially like it's uh, new leadership all the way through the company. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where they take it from here. But the rebrand, I think, looks great. Makes a lot of sense from Jack Harlow's perspective. Sounds like uh, John, the, the co-founder that we had on the podcast. Um, not sure what his involvement's going to be from here, um, but I'm, I'm sure he's been taken care of in some capacity. So. Yep. Um, all in all, cool to see. Uh, great, great uh, brain collab here. So, uh, moving on to this next story, let's uh, talk about Tesla lowering the price of the Model S and the Model X. Um, they've lowered it by uh, five thousand dollars each. So the Model S is now eighty four thousand nine hundred ninety. Model X is now ninety four thousand uh, nine hundred ninety. So um, let's talk a, a little bit about the details of the story, and then I want to kind of take this into Tesla's kind of master plan and how they are trying to pass these cost savings onto the consumer. So give us some of the details around this price yeah. drop. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty big price drop uh, for those more expensive line of vehicles that they sell. Uh, they're also uh, known to continue to uh, lower the price of the three, um, Model 3 and Model Y as well. Um, and the whole play here is to increase demand. So Tesla, they're doing two things here. Um, they're increasing demand so they can sell more vehicles, and I'll get to why that's important in just a bit in just a minute. Uh, but they're also just maintaining their market share of EVs, which is very important. Uh, if you're kind of a first mover or one of the first movers, uh, you want to continue to have that primary brand in the consumer's mind as that category as a whole grows. Um, so EVs are still, you know, a very very small sliver of overall vehicle sales, but it's growing and consumers care more about it. And so if Tesla can kind of remain that, you know, Apple per se of cars, uh, that's a big economic opportunity for them. And then the reason they want a lot of cars out in the world and they're kind of uh, focusing on affordability uh, right now versus maybe uh, profitability, uh, the reason they're doing that is because they're playing for the future where all these cars are autonomous. Um, so I don't think they're too far off from that. I mean, we've been saying that for a long time, but it just continues to get closer and closer to a point that they'll be able to turn on like a robo taxi fleet. And the day that that happens, whoever has the most cars on the road that are autonomous uh, will overnight be the most profitable car company ever. Um, and so they're kind of playing for that uh, future where cars are autonomous. And so the more cars they have on the road, the more rides they can give, the more data they're collecting, the more they can improve the algorithm. So. Uh, that's, I think, the overall play here is 
uh, get more cars out there by increasing demand and affordability, but uh, play the long game and uh, play for the autonomous future. Yeah, and when you look at when you take a step back and kind of uh, go back and look through some of Tesla's master plan that was detailed kind of all the way back in 2006, uh, they're just kind of following this playbook that they laid out really early on. So, you know, come into the market with a higher price point, know that consumers are going to be willing to pay a premium for that product, use that to uh, generate some, some, uh, some revenue, funnel that into research and development, use that to decrease the cost, and then just use that as a virtuous cycle uh, to, con- to continue to lower the cost and pass those cost savings on to consumers. So really, Tesla's playing the long game here. Uh, Elon Musk actually tweeted about that uh, earlier this week, just saying, you know, this is, this is the, the playbook we've been following for a while. Um, so of course there are all sorts of other factors on the timing of when they uh, when they do these uh, price decreases, what the market looks like at the time. Um, but I just think it's cool to to see them continue to try and pass these cost savings onto the consumers as EVs become more and more widely adopted. And I think you just have to really credit Tesla with really driving this movement and this switch to electric vehicles. You have to think it wouldn't be happening yeah, no. as fast as it's it is. It's all right because now. of Tesla. Yeah, because of yeah. Tesla. So Tesla is continuing to put pressure on the market by decreasing the price of, of these uh, electric vehicles. And, yeah. um, you know, the the other auto manufacturers are going to have to respond. Like a lot of them, seeing the demand uh, increase, have been able to raise some of their prices, whereas Tesla's kind of taking the, the opposite approach here. Well, I mean, the other car companies are in a lot of trouble. So their biggest bottleneck is the batteries. Uh, and Tesla has ramped up, you know, their battery production, supply chain, uh, uh, economies of scale greatly. And so these other car companies like Ford, you know, their biggest bottleneck are these batteries, so they literally can't build their cars. They've had to pause mm. the Ford F-150 several times as far as the manufacturing goes because they just don't have the supply chain built to support the demand. And Tesla sees that, and they're kind of putting pressure in the knife, you know, to their to their throat yeah, and saying, hey, you know, we've got the economies of scale. Uh, we're ready to decrease prices, which is a big deal. Um, and we're, we're going to, you know, push forward and continue to maintain or, or gain market share. And the other companies are really struggling, ramping up their EVs. They just can't do it. It's going to take them another five plus years to get anywhere near where Tesla is. Mm-hmm. They have to totally rebuild all their factories. They have to totally rebuild their supply chain and logistics. And it took you know Tesla now 15, 20 years to get to the point they're at. So uh, Tesla has a 10 year lead, and they're they're using it right now. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's uh, all the detail to have around that story. We'll continue to just kind of watch this. Uh, EV, um, I don't know if it's necessarily a race, maybe more of a race towards autonomous vehicles, um, but watching that play out. Um, so moving on to this next story here, uh, the Restrict Act. So as we continue to talk about TikTok being banned in the U.S., uh, we saw the congressional uh, hearings going on with the CEO of TikTok uh, and all the uh, Congress congressmen and women really grilling that CEO um, now the Restrict Act, Restrict Act has been uh, proposed as a way to effectively ban TikTok, um, but we wanted to kind of break down what's in this Restrict Act because there's been a lot of talk about uh, what, this, what this bill would actually mean if it were to be passed. Uh, so the Restrict Act is essentially just the bipartisan bill that is being considered in Congress, which would give the President and the Secretary of Commerce broad power to ban technology products from countries regarded as threats to national security. So right there off the bat, you know, they're not just naming China. They're not just naming TikTok. They're taking a very broad approach to this, which in some ways you have to understand. You don't want to play kind of whack-a-mole with, uh, with just TikTok and then something else pop up in a, in a different country, like let's say Russia, for example, that's more, more of an adversary to the United States. Um, but it's generated opposition from digital rights activists. And that's, like I said, kind of due to the vagueness of this and the sweeping powers that it would, that it would grant to the uh, executive branch. Um, and one of uh, kind of the main voices that is leading that is the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, that has concerns that the bill would criminalize the use of things like VPNs. Um, so if you don't know what a VPN is, it's essentially a way to uh, have your server um, connect to the internet from another location. Is that a, a decent way to describe what a VPN is doing? Yeah, it basically hides your location. Tech. Yeah, it hides your location on the internet. Um, it's a big thing for privacy on the internet. Um, a lot of people that want to protect their activity on the internet use VPNs. I China, use China has banned them because when you use a VPN, you can access the internet from another location. Exactly. So, yeah. for instance, if you're in China and China's banned Facebook, for instance, if you live there and you want to use Facebook, you use a VPN that might be located in the U.S. and then you can yes. you can access Facebook through that VPN. So that's why China and other 
you know, communist countries ban stuff like this. So yeah, and yeah. so they're trying to. I see what they're doing here. They're trying to be proactive about saying, okay, well, if we want to ban TikTok, the only way you can really effectively do that is by not allowing people to use a VPN to access TikTok while in the United States. So this bill is essentially giving the power to ban VPNs, which I think is very dangerous and would be a terrible, terrible thing to do just because of the amount of privacy that it can provide you when uh, operating on the internet, which I believe is just an American thing. Um, also, so like some of the proponents uh, uh, also argue that it's necessary to address potential security threats from uh, you know foreign companies like TikTok, uh, Huawei, uh, Kapersky Labs, uh, which is a, a Russian company, um, and then the critics, which kind of uh, would be that Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation, uh, they're urging Congress to pass more comprehensive consumer data protection and privacy legislation before really trying to get into the nitty gritty of how we're going to ban TikTok, which I know is something that you've been talking a lot about whenever we talk about these TikTok bans. So that's just kind of high level um, breaking down what this bill is actually saying. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz around this on social media saying it's going to ban VPNs and it's going to, you know, have criminal penalties that go along with that, which uh, is is true for the most part. But it's not explicitly banning VPNs or anything like that. It's just giving the power to do so. And I think that's dangerous. So uh, I'll pass it off to you to give yeah. your opinion on um, what we know so far. Yeah, I mean, I think our government's completely off the rails. I think they're just <laughs> – it's unbelievable that we're yeah. so focused on other countries uh, – taking data from you know our uh our our country and we're not even passing you know our own privacy laws we, we have no privacy laws uh on some companies like facebook google twitter on what they do with that data and how it moves we don't have a really comprehensive way of of governing that you know there's been pieces of it california's done a good job kind of leading the way but the rest of the country hasn't europe's done a good job passing some data privacy laws, but, you know, our own country hasn't really done a good job of this, and we're already focusing on somebody else's country. Um, I just, I think it's ridiculous, and I think we need to focus on ourselves first, create a standard, and then apply that standard to everybody else in the world, because it just comes across as, uh, one, hypocritical, um, but two, uh, I, I don't like the fact that we're starting to silence portions of the internet that, that we don't like. I mean, I do think that we need to be careful with what's going on with TikTok and, and them taking our data. Um, I'm totally for changing hands of ownership for, for TikTok into an American company uh, because it's proven that China, you know, is overtaking companies and using their data for, you know, their own reasons as a communist country. So we need to be careful of that. But I would much rather that happen after we take care of our own home. Uh, I, I just I think that uh, this is an overreach on the government, especially with this particular uh, act. You know, I think that any time that you give the executive branch this kind of power, uh, kind of sweeping power to make a decision like this, you know, that's scary. I do not want the president to have uh, that kind of ability to just say, I don't like this on the internet, so we need to, you know, ban it or, or restrict access to it. That's, that's unacceptable for an American uh, government to even consider doing that. Yeah, I think one of the other kind of overarching, overarching issues with this bill, with most bills in general, is that they're just so broad and vague that it just kind of gives power in ways that we don't necessarily want to give power. Like, just like you said, like, it's definitely an issue for TikTok to have access to the data that they do and for it, uh, you know, by way of ownership by ByteDance for China to have access to that data as well. But to pass a bill like this is just so broad and so vague and so hard to understand unless you know what to look for within this kind of stuff. I think that's just like the broader issue yeah. with trying to solve issues like this at the at the government level. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's also just putting the power in the executive branch's hands. Like we've had two clowns for presidents back to back, <laughs> and we're giving them power over internet. Like I'm just not yeah. okay with that. I mean, I don't. I could never be okay with Trump, you know, having that kind of power. And same with Biden. Like I, I, he well, doesn't that's even. The thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It's like even if the current president that introduces this legislation is not the one that's going to take advantage of like the full extent of the power that that bill would grant. That's not to say that a president or two away from, from that elected president would not take advantage of using that power. Yeah. Um, and we saw what Trump did with that data yeah, with Facebook. Exactly. Like that's why exactly. that's arguably one of the reasons why he was elected. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't think we want that kind of power in the president's hands. Agreed. Um, all right. So to move on from that story uh, and get into our AI edge, our, our, ugh, and get into our AI edge segment. 
So AI Edge is when we give stories, tips, and topics for gaining an edge with artificial intelligence. Uh, the primary story here as we see the AI race really kick off and ramp up uh, primarily between OpenAI uh, and uh, thereby Microsoft and then Google, uh, who has been developing large language models for quite some time, but has uh, recently just kind of fallen behind as ChatGPT uh, and Microsoft have really um, taken a lead, at least initially here. Um, so Sundar uh, Pichai has come out and basically said that uh, search is going to implement um, AI, which is kind of a no-brainer. We've already seen Microsoft do that with Bing, um, but it is now coming down the pipe for Google as well. I think this is just a huge deal because uh, I don't have the percentage off the top of my head, but I know a large percentage of uh, internet search is going through Google. So as soon as Google introduces AI into search, that's when I think things really get real. I think that's when the major shift starts to happen is when the two main search engines that people use to get information from the internet now uh, use AI to power them. That's when things change. So uh, what's your take on that? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, Google has a major advantage when it comes to distribution through YouTube and Google search two biggest search engines in the world. So the second that they just kind of seamlessly integrate something like uh, a language model into that and allow you to have more conversational search, uh, it's a big deal. So they'll be able to acquire a lot, a lot of data very quickly to improve those models. Um, they're kind of behind the, behind the ball right now when it comes to uh, large language models and kind of chat uh, user experiences around search compared to open AI. Uh, but the day they, I think, put the throttle down, uh, I think they do have an advantage. Um, although the advantage, in my opinion, is just distribution. I think from a product perspective, OpenAI already kind of uh, seems to have an advantage, uh, massive advantage on that front. Um, and they're acquiring kind of a network effect here uh, and the brand. Um, so really, they've kind of created a, a net new category of technology around this AI and conversational intelligence. Um, Google really hasn't done it yet, but Google has the biggest brands in the world with Google search and YouTube. So uh, pretty unique kind of battle going on here uh, between the two brands. Yeah, um, agreed. I think that it's just one of those things that's going to really fuel uh, the next next wave of the internet, um, just in terms of how you interface with information on the web. Um, so moving on from that story on to our tip of the week. Um, so I think I really, I just want to take a second to talk about the tip of the week because as I've talked to friends who are not necessarily involved in like tech and startups or follow along closely what's going on here, and I guess really most of the people who listen to this podcast are probably following along pretty closely, but it seems like a lot of people that I'm talking to about AI have not even tried ChatGPT, and I just want to emphasize the importance of just getting on there and playing with it before talking about this tip of the week. Yeah, I've got a quick story for that. Yeah. So I was at uh, UK speaking to Gadden College, uh, their living learning program, and it was a classroom of freshmen, uh, about 30 freshmen in the, in the classroom, and I had them raise their hand if they had used artificial intelligence. Uh, and only one of them raised their hand. And I was kind of amazed by that because I would assume the majority of the class would have tried it. And they all were just kind of looking at each other like they were guilty of something or they were like confused. And then I kind of started to realize that I should ask them, like, what are your teachers telling you? And all of them just said, they're telling us not to use it, which is just completely unacceptable, in my opinion, as a teacher to tell your students not to use artificial intelligence. I think that is just like a clown move as a teacher to just not let them or tell them to not use this thing. Um, so it is kind of amazing how many people still need to try this because this is the greatest technology advancement ever. And to tell somebody not to use it, I think, is just a bad move. Yeah. And I think, you know, as I as we talk to friends about this and anybody that's wondering, you know, how can I keep up with AI or, you know, continue to gain an edge, that's literally the point of this segment of the podcast. It It's as simple as just getting on and experimenting with it, just playing with it. Um, so anyway, leading that into kind of the tip of the week here, I want to share my screen and go over um, a chat that I had with, uh, with ChatGPT uh, last weekend. So I was just messing around. I've had this idea for, it's a really simple idea, and I know it would be really simple to code but I don't know how to code. Um, and I just wanted to have basically an SMS chat bot to where I could text back and forth with ChatGPT so that I could kind of access it whenever I wanted to. Um, like I said, I know nothing about coding. So I got on to ChatGPT. I said, hey, I'd like to create a ChatGPT SMS chat bot by connecting Twilio's API to ChatGPT's API. I know almost nothing about coding. Do you think you can help me figure out how to do it? 
And just to show you how in depth it broke this down for me, it gave me step by step uh, what I needed to do. It linked to the things I needed to download onto my computer. It gave me the code to copy and paste into the terminal on my computer. And then anytime I had a question about anything that uh, had to do with the instructions it gave me or ran into an issue, I would just say, hey, this download is giving me the option to open one thing versus another, for example, which one should I open? And then it would explain it and it would help me kind of learn the step-by-step -step process of trying to connect Twilio's API to ChatGPT's API. So I just think that this should really call out, like if you're wanting to learn about something, we keep talking about uh, artificial intelligence for education. This is just incredible to me that it can break it down step-by-step -step, and anytime I run into a problem, I can come back and, and say, hey, here's the problem I'm encountering. I can even copy and paste in the code output that I'm getting and it's gonna tell me exactly what's going on. So I know this is not perfect. Any way that actually codes out there is probably like, yeah, this you're gonna run into all sorts of problems doing that. But for somebody who has you know, no real knowledge of coding, it's really impressive to me that it can break it down like this and then answer my questions as I run into problems. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to call that one out. I think it's, if I, I hear friends all the time are like, you know, I've got this app idea, like how would I build this? Go into ChatGPT, describe your app. No more excuses, app, no more excuses. Describe your app as detailed as you can and say, how would I build this? And I promise you it's gonna give you some high level overview of how you would go about doing that and then just start tinkering and hacking away. And that's probably, as of right now, that's probably the best way I would know of to like figure out, if you're not a technical founder, to figure out how to like build an MVP of this idea that you might have in your head. So I was blown away um, by, by what it was able to tell me about creating a, an SMS chat bot with the APIs here. So uh, anything you feel like adding to, to that portion of it? No. Um, all right, well, good deal. So that concludes our AI Edge segment. Uh, before we wrap up here, we are um, kind of restructuring how we do our founder interviews. So we're now gonna call those the Spotlight Series, uh, which is basically just when we uh, talk to uh, startup founders and entrepreneurs in our ecosystem, uh, whether we're keeping tabs on companies we've already talked to or we're talking to new companies. Uh, we just wanted to essentially break that out into its own little series. Um, so it's going to be kind of a more condensed, higher impact uh, interview. Um, so typically 20 to 30 minutes talking with the founder of the company and what that company does. Um, so we're going to be posting that uh, on a separate uh, podcast. It's going to be on the same feed. It's going to be posted at the same time. Uh, so after listening to this podcast, you can just hop on to the next episode uh, and hear our interview over there. So for this uh, week's Spotlight series, we talked with uh, a company called Prognostics that is based out of Oldham County, Kentucky. Uh, so we talked to doctors Aaron and Stephen uh, Carithers. I hope I said the, that last name right there. Um, and that is a father-son duo that is building a really cool, um, essentially diagnostics process for um, being able to detect uh, early onset uh, type 2 diabetes. Can you provide a little bit more color to that? Because uh, I know that that was just a really complex uh, complex uh, test and diagnostic uh, process that they were building there. Yeah, so I mean, uh, diabetes can lead to a lot of more serious issues like uh, kidney disease, and uh, Prognostics has created a way to detect what diabetes side effects could be and how serious they'll be, uh, and if it's going to continue to develop, and then they can s kind of step in and be preventative based on those test results. And now they have uh, the ability to start to treat these things. So the test results have also come out at the exact same time as the ability to treat mm -hmm. these uh, diseases like kidney disease. So it's perfect timing for a test like this to to, uh, to launch. And so it's really cool that that's coming out of uh, you know our university system here in the state and our commercialization teams across the state are working to bring this uh, to market and help these founders in the state of Kentucky. KY Innovation has done a, a great job with technology like this, so it's a cool story. Yeah, and just one last thing to highlight about that is uh, Kentucky's SBIR matching funds. Uh, this company, Prognostics, got to take advantage of that, um, which is just really important to highlight. That's uh, you know one of those things that's uh, might be kind of difficult to understand what it is or how you'd go about um, applying for that. So they they dive into um, that whole process as well. So like I said, that's going to be posted at the exact same time as this podcast. You can just go back to our podcast feed and hop into that interview. Uh, and we hope you guys enjoy. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you guys next week.